Hallelujah. I just want to thank and praise Yahweh Almighty for this message. It's really been an encouragement to me, and I pray as I bring forth the word that it would minister to you as it has ministered to me. I was so excited about this message because, you know, church was canceled last week, and I was supposed to present it last week. And I've just been meditating on it, you know, and sharing it with people at work. You know, I'm probably going to get a memo about not mixing religion into the workplace, but I fully expect to get that soon. But I'm really excited, so I'm going to try to calm my nerves, you know, so I can, like, get in, you know. So I'm going to start off with a little pop quiz. Who can tell me what the most well-known verse in the Bible is amongst saints and sinners alike? Most well-known. Leo. John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16, right? Okay, let me see how many of you know it off by heart. Show of hands. How many people have memorized John 3.16? Okay, let me hear it. I want to hear it. Hallelujah. Okay. Now that verse summarizes Yahweh's relationship with humanity and the way of salvation. So would you say that that's like a key verse in the life of a believer? That somebody who professes to be a follower of Yeshua, that that's a verse that they would kind of know or commit to memory, right? So it has a lot of significance. It's important, right? I would say it's probably one of the most important verses in the scripture, right? So now my question is, how many of you have ever taken the time to put that verse into context? In other words, how many of you have actually read John chapter 3 and put John 3.16 in context, what he's saying? See, the vast majority of people today who consider themselves Christian, followers of Christ, right? They don't read the Bible, right? Right? So if you don't read the Bible, we know in John it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know that the Word is Yeshua, right? So we say that we're followers of Yeshua, but how can we be if we don't read the Word, right? And this is where there's false belief that simply believing is enough to save me. You know, for y'all so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. So you meet people and they say, I believe in God. I believe. So my question is, what God? Which God? The God of the Bible? So you read the Bible and you know this God and you understand this God and you're living in accordance to this God's word, right? No, 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 I don't do any of that, but I believe. I believe in God, right? It's a simple thing. All you got to do is believe. You don't have to do anything else. If anybody tells you you have to do anything else, they're a legalist. They're telling you some, you just have to believe. Well, let me ask you a question. Does Satan believe that Yahweh is real and that he exists and that he is the creator of heaven and earth? Does Satan have intimate knowledge of Yahweh? In other words, he's had conversation with him, right? Is he saved? It's not just about simple belief. Now, the verse that I want to preach on today comes out of John chapter 3, but I want to put it into context. I don't think you should ever take one scripture out of the Bible and build your whole faith around it. You need to take the word as a whole, right? And so we're going to look at John chapter 3. I'll try to read it quickly as not to, like, lose people, but we need to have context to understand the next phase of the message. So open your swords, if you have them, to John chapter 3. I would like everybody to follow along so that you can see John 3.16 in context. Not preaching on John 3.16, but this will put that into context as well. John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Yeshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from Elohim. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except Elohim be with him. Yeshua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahweh. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yeshua answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Yeshua answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For Yah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For Yah sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Elohim. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in Elohim. So looking at this first 21 verses, and those are red letter texts. And I always like to pay, you know, special attention to the red letter text because these are the words of our Savior himself, right? So we should put a little bit more weight on what Yeshua says himself, right? So when we look at this chapter, the first part of it is talking about regeneration, being born again. It's about being born from above, being made new. You know, Beth always talks about how he's not remodeling the old me. He's not bringing additions on the old me. He's actually making me a brand new creation, a new nature, new principles, new affections, a new mindset. Regeneration. We must be made new. I want you guys to understand that apart from regeneration, your belief in Yeshua does not benefit you at all. I'm basing that on the verse where it says, Verily, verse 5, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. Regeneration, born again, born from above, made new. We didn't get to belief yet, did we? So simply believing is not enough. We have to have true belief, belief to the point where we actually line our actions up with, with the things that we profess, right? We have to have a belief that transforms us. Simple head knowledge, that belief does not save anybody. It doesn't save anybody. We must be born again. We must also believe that Yeshua is who he says he is. You have to believe that he is the only begotten son of Yahweh. You have to believe that he is deity. You have to believe that he is who he says he is. And you must believe that he did what he said he was going to do. You have to believe that. He goes on in this scripture to talk about how true belief will bring you to the light. But the condemnation of the world is they don't like the light. They prefer the darkness to the light, and therefore their deeds are evil. And the scripture says they are not born again. They are not regenerated. They are not his. They're not his. It says those that doeth the truth come to the light. We come to the light. We want to be refined in the fire. We want to be reproved and corrected because we want to be able to stand before a holy, holy, holy God, unafraid and clothed in the righteousness of our Savior, Yeshua. 
If you continue reading that chapter, it goes on to talk about how Yeshua baptized people, which is yet another step to true saving faith, right? He talks about baptism. So we can all agree that it's not just a head knowledge belief, I believe, right? See, me saying I believe I can fly doesn't make it so, right? I can jump off of a building. I believe I can fly, right? Now jump off of the building and guess what happens to me? I die. Because my belief was not rooted in fact or truth or evidence. It's just simply my thought process, right? We don't want to have that kind of belief because that belief does not lead to glory, right? So today I want to focus on a specific verse in this chapter, one that I think oftentimes is overlooked. And my hope is by expounding on this verse, it will put John 3.16 into like a better perspective for you. Okay, so the verse that I'm talking about today is actually John 3, 14. It says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This verse is actually foreshadowed from the Old Testament. In other words, it's a typology, something that happens in the Old Testament, and then you see it fulfilled in the New Testament, right? Right? Now, a lot of times when people are reading scripture, they just kind of read straight through and they just probably pass right over that verse, right? But today I want us to actually look at that verse so we can get a better understanding of what John 3, 16 is about, right? So with this verse, it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. How many people are familiar with what Yeshua is saying here? How many people know what he's talking about? I promise you that a lot of people in the mainstream church have no clue about this because they don't read the Old Testament. So in order for us to understand what Yeshua is trying to explain to us, we have to go back and see what this is all about. So turn with me to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21. We have to see this story in context to get a better understanding of what Yeshua is trying to say to us when he speaks these words. So in Numbers chapter 4, now just to bring you up to speed, this story takes place after Yahweh has delivered the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt. Now you know when they were in Egypt in bondage, he sent Moses to be their deliverer, to bring them out of Egypt, right? And in the process of doing so, he took out every one of the Egyptian gods. See, that's what the ten plagues are all about. All of the plagues are targeting the gods of the Egyptians. He's showing his power and his might. He's showing that he is the true God, the only true God. So he destroys all of their gods. But in the process, he keeps the children of Israel safe, right? These things that are happening, they're okay. It's affecting the Egyptians, right? So he takes them out of Egypt, and Pharaoh changes his mind. He gets mad. He says, you know what? We're going after them. I'm not letting them go. Let's go. He gets his whole host together, horses and chariots, and he chases them down, and he gets them up against the Red Sea. So they got Pharaoh's army coming on them, and they are stopped at the Red Sea. And Yahweh, in his mercy and his grace, he shows up and he shows off, right? He makes a way where there is no way. He parts the waters and allows the children of Israel to cross over on dry land. And as the enemy tries to come after them, he lets them get in the midst, and then he He closes the waters on them and he destroys them, right? And then he feeds them with manna from heaven. He gives them water from a rock. He is making provision for them. He has protected them from their enemies. He has delivered them from the bondage of slavery. He's done all of these things. And now we get to Numbers 21. The children of Israel. Verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against Yahweh and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. 
Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahweh and against thee. Pray unto Yahweh that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. Look and live. Look and live. So what we see here is despite the fact that Yahweh did all of these miraculous things for them, they have the audacity and the nerve to complain and to grumble. After seeing these mighty wonders and works that he has done, after experiencing them firsthand, they grumble and complain and even have the nerve to say, we were better off when we were in Egypt. You brought us out here to die, right? They are such an ungrateful people, aren't they? And I think about it and I say, oh, help us, y'all. Is it possible, saints, that we are guilty of the same? Is it possible, saints, that Yahweh has delivered us out of this sin, sick, and dying world? Is it possible, saints, that he has delivered us from the bondage of our sin? That he has fed us the living bread, hallelujah. That he has blessed us with his spirit to overcome this sinful flesh. That he has showed up and showed off and made a way where there was no way for us to be reconciled back to him. But yet, yet, we grumble and we complain. We have the audacity to think that things were easier for us. Things were better for us when we were in the world, living for ourselves, right? Yahweh is not pleased. And this is what Yahweh does to them. He sends a plague of poisonous snakes among them. People are being bitten. The venom is penetrating their body and they're dying. And then they come to the realization that they have sinned against Yahweh and that Yahweh sent this plague. So they repent, and they go before Moses, the deliverer, and ask him to intercede on their behalf before Yahweh. And Yahweh shows up and shows off. He makes a way out of no way. This, saints, is a type of Yeshua on Calvary. This is a type of foreshadowing of Yeshua on Calvary. I want you guys to really look at this. The people who were bitten, they were dying there was absolutely nothing they could do for themselves. There was no medicine. There was no cure. They couldn't heal themselves. If you got bit, you were good as dead, right? right? But Yahweh used the very thing that plagued them, the curse of the serpents. He puts one on a pole and he lifts it up and he says, those that look upon it will live. They will live. Now, it's easy for us to look at this picture and see where the pole represents the cross, right? But then you have to think, why does the serpent represent Yeshua? I mean, let's think about that for a minute. Yeshua is pure and holy and righteous and everything good, right? And the serpent in Scripture is depicted as evil, cursed. In the garden, it had legs, right? And it was part of the cause of the fall of man, right? Deceiving Eve and, you know, lying. And, and Yahweh put a curse on the serpent and took his legs. He would slither lowly on the ground for the rest of his days. Serpent is like curse, right? So why in the world would the serpent represent Yeshua? Hmm. In 2 Corinthians it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh through him. In other words, Yeshua was made to be our sin when he was crucified on Calvary. Crucified as a common criminal and made to be our sin. I mean, this gets deep, right? I mean, do y'all see like the direction I'm trying? Do y'all, y'all with me? This, this is deep, right? See, when the children of Israel got bit by the snakes, they were doomed. They were condemned to die. There was nothing they could do, right? They didn't have the antidote, right? Let me tell you something about antidotes. Just quickly, if you get bit by a snake for real today, how they come up with the antidote is they take some of the venom of the poisonous snake that bit you, and they mix that venom with medications or whatever, and that is the antidote, okay? Are y'all with me? 
Are y'all with me? So, so let's, go, let's go back to the old first. Now bring it to the new. In the Old Testament, it's the serpents. It's the curse, right? He puts a serpent on the pole. This is the antidote, saints. You know, people are being bit by snakes. Why do I want to look at a snake, right? But this snake doesn't have the venom. This snake is the cure. You understand what I'm saying? We look at Yeshua. Yeshua came down, divested himself of his glory, and came in this sinful flesh, right? The likeness of us, right? But he didn't have the sin within him that we have within us, right? And he took all of that from us. He took your sin, and he put it on himself, right? And hung on the cross a curse. He that had no sin became a curse. The serpent was a curse. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm saying, saints? It's no different for us. We have been infected with sin. We are doomed. We are destined to die. There's no hope for us in and of ourselves. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. Yeshua provided a way out of no way for us, right? Just like he did for the children of Israel. But just like them, the serpents are slithering around on the ground and Yahweh says you need to look at the one that is lifted up and you will be healed. I'm sure some of them didn't look. You want to know why? They're too busy looking at the serpents on the ground, afraid to get bit, making sure they're clear of harm's way, right? They're distracted. It's no different for us. Yahweh says, look unto Yeshua and be healed, be saved, be delivered, be redeemed, right? But we're looking at the serpents in our life. We're looking at addictions. and We're looking at stress and struggle, financial problems, health problems, all these different circumstances. They're distractions. They are distractions. They are keeping us from looking unto Yeshua. Keeping us bound, saints, in our death bound. We must look and live. Everybody say look and live. Look and live. Turn with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Yahshua. Looking unto Yahshua. Looking unto Yahshua, the author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of Yahweh. I want us to focus on looking unto Yeshua because that saints is the secret to running this race successfully that saints is the secret to standing before a holy 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 God clothed in the righteousness of Yeshua unashamed unafraid hallelujah looking unto Yeshua is the way for us to begin our walk well Looking unto Yeshua is the way for us to continue to do well. Looking unto Yeshua is the way for us to end well, right? Looking unto Yeshua. Now, when you read the scripture all through the word, we have patriarchs and prophets, apostles. You know, we have men and women, martyrs, all of which looked unto Yeshua. Are you looking unto Yeshua? Do you really even understand what that means? What does it mean to look unto Yeshua? I mean, physically, he's not here, right? Like, I, I can't physically see him because he's ascended back into heaven and he is right now presently seated in the heavenly realm at the right hand of the Father, right? As a man, he can only be in one place at one time, and that place is the place of honor with Yahweh the Father. But let us not forget that Yeshua is Elohim, hallelujah. Yeshua is Yahweh, hallelujah. He is deity. He is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, hallelujah. And he fills the heavens and the earth, right? We can literally see Yeshua everywhere spiritually. He is all around us. 
So how do we look to Yeshua? We look to Yeshua by faith. We look to Yeshua by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what the scripture is talking about. Looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, hallelujah, set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is sat down at the right hand of the throne of Yahweh. But for the joy, saints. Do you want to know what the joy is? I'm the joy. I'm the joy, hallelujah. You are the joy, hallelujah. See, we say for y'all so love the world, and we make it this grand thing. Well, let me tell you something. For y'all so love Denise, hallelujah. But for the joy set before him, but for Denise set before him, he endured what he went through to get to Calvary so that Denise, hallelujah, would have an opportunity to stand before a holy God, hallelujah, unafraid and unashamed. He did that for each and every one of us. For y'all so loved, whatever your name is, but for the joy, but for whatever your name is. He did it for you. He did it for me, hallelujah. We are called to look unto Yeshua by faith based on the knowledge of who he is and what he has already done. Are you looking unto Yeshua? John 3, 14 says, As Moses lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness, and the Israelites that looked upon her were healed, so must we look at Yeshua. And we have to trust him, saints. See, trust comes in because we read the word, we believe the word by faith, and we walk it out. You don't trust a complete stranger. People talk about how they believe in God, but they don't read the word. They don't know him, so they can't trust him. They can't trust him to keep him, protect him, provide for him, lead God and direct him. We got to trust, right, by faith. We must also have confidence in him and rely on him and come with great expectation that he's going to move in our situation. That's what this scripture is talking about when it says looking unto Yeshua. So I want to break this down because I feel like if you don't understand what looking unto Yeshua means, you can't successfully walk this walk. You need to get this. Many people say they believe, but they can't explain to you what that means. Many people say they trust them, but they can't explain what that means. It's no wonder there's no stability in their walk or no real fruitfulness in their life because they have a weak understanding of Yeshua. Their perception of him is small. They don't understand the gravity of what he's done. So since they have a weak understanding of him, that weak understanding produces a weak walk, weak fruit, a weak witness. We want to be strong in Yahweh and the power of his might. We want to go forth boldly in the authority of his name, right? We don't want to be weak in any area of our walk of salvation. So my goal today is to give you a true understanding of what looking to Yeshua means, what it looks like. Now, when it comes to spiritual things, more often than not, there's three different ways to look at it. The scripture says that Yahweh is the God who was, who is, and who is to come. And so if we want to truly look at the whole picture of looking unto Yeshua, the one who was and is and is to come, then we have to look at him from the past, the present, and the future perspective, right? Because in doing that, we can see the whole picture. So that's what I want to do. I want to present looking unto Yeshua from three different perspectives. So the first one, of course, is to look back, the past, Yeshua that was, and see his finished work on Calvary. We need to look and see Yeshua crucified. What will you see? As you look to Yeshua in faith, looking upon his work on Calvary, you will see the only begotten son of Yahweh who suffered and bled and agonized and died in order to pay your soul's debt and make satisfaction for your sins. You will see the greatest display of love 
that ever took place since the foundation of the world. The greatest display of love. You will see your value to him. You will see your worth to him. You will see the depths of his heart for you. You will see the one that was without sin suffer horribly because of your sin. Your sin, saints. Sin is not something that we need to be taken lightly. We never should minimize our sin, justify it, excuse it. You know, we never should do that. It's not a small thing. Our sin did this to him. Our sin. Every time I sin, it's another lash of the whip on his back, peeling his flesh away. My sin. I did that. Your sin. You did that. Every time I sin, it's another thrust of the hammer driving a nail through his flesh. I did that. Sin should never be taken lightly, saints. It didn't cost us anything to receive this salvation, but it cost him everything. Blood, sweat, tears, and his life. You will see the just die for the unjust so that we might be reconciled unto Yahweh, the perfect, spotless lamb of Yahweh, bearing our sin, carrying our transgression. You will see the servant of Yahweh allowing himself to become a curse for us, the sinners, the guilty ones, so that we might be set free from all guilt and counted innocent before Yahweh. Everything wicked you have ever done Lying, cheating, killing, stealing, destroying your life and the lives of others was imputed unto him. He took it off of us and took it on himself. And he took off his righteous robe and he clothed us in it. So that when Yahweh looks upon us, he will see the righteousness of Yeshua. Hallelujah. Paul says the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of Yahweh who loved me and gave his life for me. I mean, this just gets better and better, saints. Not only did he save my life, for that alone I would be indebted to him for all my days. Not only did he save my life, he pardoned me and reconciled me to Yahweh, but he took it further and he gave me his life, hallelujah. He gave me his righteousness, hallelujah. He gave me his Holy Spirit, hallelujah, so that I could move like he moved in the darkness, hallelujah. When I look with the eyes of faith unto Yeshua and see his death, it will give me a clear perception of the only way of forgiveness. It will give me a clear perception of the depths of his love for me. A clear understanding that he is the remedy. He is the antidote. That apart from him, there is no salvation for me. I will have a clear perception that I am justified just as if I never done it. And I am reconciled. And I am accepted by Yahweh. Nothing but his atonement for my sin can ever give me these things. His substitution, his satisfaction, his atoning death, his sacrifice for sin. It's all right there. Do you see it? Do you see it? What love unfathomable comes from looking back to Yeshua and his death on Calvary? To know that when we were guilty, he took our penalty. That when we were lost and without hope, he became our hope. Hallelujah. That he died that we might be saved and redeemed and set free. We must look unto Yahshua and his finished work on Calvary because that is the foundation of true saving faith. Looking unto Yeshua and remembering that he was the perfect sacrifice should bring us a joy unspeakable, hallelujah, and an inward peace, that peace that passes all understanding. Because looking to anything or anyone else is in vain. 
It means nothing. Those things and those people cannot bear the weight of your sin. They can't deliver you. They cannot reconcile you to a holy, holy, holy L. We need to rest on nothing but Yeshua and him crucified and the atonement that he made for us on Calvary. John 3, 14. Look and live. Look and live. See, many people today are looking to something other than Yeshua and they wonder why this doesn't work for them. This don't work for me. I read my Bible, I pray, I go to church. It don't work for me. Look unto Yeshua. Look unto Yeshua and work that he has already done for his people. And know and believe with confidence that he did it for you. For you. The second way we want to look at him is presently. Yahweh who was and who is. Yahweh is. Presently, we need to look unto Yeshua. We look upward because Yeshua is seated at the right hand of the Father. The same Savior who died for you is exalted in the place of highest honor and doing the work of intercessor, hallelujah, and advocate for your soul. What we heard this earlier today, right, with Sister Becky, he is interceding on your behalf. Yeshua's ministry did not end with his death. He rose again, saints, and ascended to heaven to carry on the work that he started here for who? You. Hallelujah. Our scripture speaks of a living faith in a living Savior. He is risen. He is alive, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith. He did not just die to justify his people. He died and rose again to justify, to intercede, and ultimately, hallelujah, to glorify his people. Right now, our high priest lives to make intercession for us. He is on the throne, saints, yes. interceding on your behalf, interceding on my behalf. We serve a risen Savior, hallelujah. He lives even right now. He knows you by name. He presents your name to the Father and continuously pleads your cause. He moves in mercy and in grace for us and watches over us with an eye that never sleeps. He's ready morning, noon, and night to hear your confession. Ready morning, noon, and night to grant you absolution, to strengthen you for duty, to comfort you in trial, to guide you through this life, to hold you up hallelujah, in temptation to preserve you safely on this journey to the kingdom, hallelujah, which he has already prepared for us. Hallelujah, we serve a risen Savior. He gives us strength, hallelujah, in all of our battles. He's always with us. We are never alone, never neglected, never without a friend, never forsaken, hallelujah. We need to look to Yeshua daily and hold fast to the promises in his word. The scripture says, Yahweh is not a man that he should lie. You hold fast to these promises because they will happen because he said they would. Looking back, we saw the blood, the sacrifice, the atonement, the satisfaction for sin. And that in and of itself was amazing, right? More than we deserved. But he didn't stop there. It always gets better, saints. It always gets better. Yeshua, our high priest, is in the heavens interceding daily for his people. He is the living king. Hallelujah. He is the living king restoring peace between us and the Father, leading and guiding and directing us by his spirit and his word, constantly providing nourishment for us, feeding us yes. daily, my daily bread. We must not leave out any part of looking unto Yeshua. We need to see the whole picture. We looked back to the past and saw Calvary. We looked to the present. And see Yeshua interceding on our behalf. Now we must look to what is to come. The Yah who was, who is, who is to come. We need to look unto Yeshua who is to come, right? You do know he's coming back, saints, right? You do know that he's coming back to collect his bride, hallelujah. So now, when we look at this scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, and it talks about 
looking unto Yeshua, our Savior, based on who he is and what he's done. And it talks about him being seated at the right hand of the Father. That is the past and present perspective. But if we continue reading, we will find that Yeshua is our future hope, that Yeshua is coming again. We will see that the eternal son of Yahweh will come again on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Yeshua is coming again, hallelujah. Looking unto Yeshua, he will come, he will raise the dead, he will change the living, he will punish the wicked and reward the godly. He will summon every man, woman, and child before him at the judgment seat and give to everyone according to their works. He will come to cast out sin and all of its consequences. Disease, death, sorrow, pain, tears, wars, poverty, injustice, and oppression. Hallelujah. We see the world right now defiled by the presence of evil and by the curse that remains. But we will see the earth one day, hallelujah, restored to its former state. Regenerated, hallelujah. Back to the time when Yahweh created it and called everything good, right? This, saints, is the remedy against depression, against hopelessness and despair, sadness and anxiety. The hope that we have in the return of our Savior should shed abroad in our hearts security, security and excitement and joy when other people are cast down and perplexed we will be able to lift our heads and rejoice hallelujah rejoice like Beth said and be glad when all the world seems dark and gloomy we will see the light to come hallelujah and know that our best is yet to come hallelujah our best is yet to come we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this too shall pass we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that our ladder will be greater hallelujah if i know that this too shall pass i can't get bogged down by the cares of this world the struggles that i gotta go through the trials and the tribulation this is temporary this will pass away behold i make all things new hallelujah we can hold fast to the promise. We don't have to fear war amongst the nations. We don't have to fear economic disaster, global panic, environmental issues. We don't have to fear health concerns, the Zika virus. We don't have to fear these things because we are looking forward to the return of Yeshua coming in his glory, hallelujah. And that should bring us comfort, saints, and peace and joy, hallelujah. Yahweh is not slack concerning his promises. When we read his word and believe what he says, the whole world can shake around you. You can lose everything in this life. You can lose your very life. But know this, your best is yet to come, hallelujah. Your best is yet to come. The blessed hope that we have when we look forward to Yeshua's second coming should sustain us. It should keep us, calm us in the midst of all this calamity. Yeshua has been lifted up. Look and live. Just like the brazen serpent in Moses' day. When they looked upon it, they were healed. All we need to do is look upon Yeshua and we will be healed also. I want you to know that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I am free, saints. You are free, no longer bound. Look and live. If you look back to Calvary, you focus on Calvary. You are a wise man. Wise man. But if you look back to Calvary and you look to the present that Yeshua, our Savior, is interceding on our behalf right now today, Right now in this moment, interceding on our behalf, you are wiser still. But if you look at all three, if you look at Yeshua, who was, who is, and who is to come, you look at the cross, you look at the intercession, and you look at his second coming, you are the wisest of all. You are the wisest of all, hallelujah. I'm just going to end by reading Hebrews 12 again. I want you guys to hold fast to this. 
looking unto Yeshua. Looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set it down at the right hand of the throne of Yahweh. Look and live. Hallelujah.